Let's make like bread and loaf. <laughs> I just made that up. I'm freestyling right now, Sean. Oh, sh Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalists Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. Hopefully, less debt today uh, is what we're going to be talking about. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. Indeed. Welcome to episode number 28. We're just talking about debt today. And I'll tell you this, we are in the middle of a debt crisis, especially in the United States, but really in, in the Western world overall. It seems like we didn't learn our our lesson from 2008 and that crash, and we're accumulating more and more debt as a as a society. The average uh, person in America has uh, four active credit cards in in his or her wallet. Yeah, uh, one in ten Americans has more than ten active credit cards. That was me back in my my. Uh, Lotus eating twenties. I I had fourteen active. Does that credit include cards. like the Lowe's credit cards? Oh, totally. And sometimes I would put more on a Banana Republic card <laughs> th than I than I would on you know a regular regular Mastercard, whatever that By means. Banana Republic, he means Brooks Brothers. Yeah. Also, I had a Brooks Brothers card as well, <laughs> oh. so I had both. Um, and and, and so. One in 10 Americans has 10 or more active credit cards. The average credit card debt in the United States right now is more than $15,000. 15000 That's insane. And, and, and so... It's like six months' salary for a lot of people. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I mean, and so if I, if I, look, if I look at um, uh, overall consumer debt in, in the United States, it's approaching $12 trillion. Dollars. What's the national debt? It's uh, close to twelve trillion. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. I think I think. Well, it might even be higher than that now. But but yeah. So so we're we're approaching the national debt in our own Jeez. consumer <laughs> debt. Good grief. And and so, um, let's talk about what that means, really, because twelve trillion is impossible for us to wrap our our mind around. If I were to go out and spend a dollar every single second, one dollar a second, one two. $3, $4, $5, without sleeping, Ryan. If I didn't sleep and I spent a dollar a second, it would only take me 31,000 years to spend $1 trillion. Wow. And we have $12 trillion in debt. Let's put it in perspective even more. If you went out and spent $1 million, a million dollars, one million. every single day, if you, if you would have been doing that since the birth of the Buddha... You still would not have spent one trillion dollars by now, and we have twelve trillion dollars worth of debt. Well, we are in the middle of a in, debt crisis. By the way, the national debt is eighteen trillion. That's what I was thinking. I, I thought it was close to nineteen at yeah. this point. That is and, that is insane, we, though. We, we keep adding to it. So that that's the the national debt for for the United States. Our consumer debt, which is mortgages and credit cards and car loans and and second mortgages and refinancing <laughs> and and payday loans and all of these other things uh 12 trillion dollars almost and and it's not uh, there isn't a lot of hope in sight and the reason we have a debt crisis right now is we have an education crisis and we hope to mm. educate you today on some of our ways because Ryan and I have been on I would say all three sides of this equation Ryan and I grew up really poor didn't have very much money and and we were very discontented by our lack of money and then of course we we climbed the corporate ladder throughout our 20s, made good money, made outstanding money. At the pinnacle of my career, I was making uh, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, but I was spending even better money and had massive amounts of debt. I had over, over six figures of debt, and that doesn't count my mortgage. I had close to half a million dollars in debt if you added uh, my mortgage in there. And so what, what we experienced was both sides there, but now we experience a different side, almost this of, of this uh, triangle of, of, of living. We, we were poor, and then we made good money, and then we became the minimalist. We walked away from corporate careers, made appreciably less money, but in the process, started living more intentionally, living more deliberately, and part of that was being more deliberate with the money 
that we have. And, and, and so we're going to talk to you about that today. We're going to answer some questions. And our first voicemail question is, actually, we're going to play two back-to-back here because they're both kind of about credit cards. They're fairly similar, but they were different enough that we included both. We obviously can't include everyone's voicemails when, when they call in, but these were, were different. So we have a, a one voicemail from Andy in Chicago and then Erica in Iowa. Listen, listen to those, and then we'll, uh, we'll come back with some answers. Um, I am trying to pay down my credit card debts right now, and I am finally getting close to paying off my highest interest with the credit card, and I was just wondering, um, once I get this paid off, uh, should I just go ahead and cancel it? I know I've read that, you know, you don't want to cancel your credit cards right away because it'll ruin your credit score, blah, blah, blah. But uh, after kind of adopting the minimalist lifestyle, I don't really want credit cards anymore. So I was just looking to uh, get your advice on what to do once I get done with the credit cards and get them all paid off. Just go ahead and cancel them or if I should hold on to them for a rainy day. I know that just in case is uh, not uh, the kind of thing that we want to do. Thanks, Andy. Here's a question from Erica as well. Currently, I am debt-free, but I have credit cards, and I have actually a safety net that's bigger than the limit on my credit cards. So um, I'm kind of battling, like, why should I even keep it? Um, I don't use it, really. Um, So I didn't know if you guys had credit cards or if, you know, once you paid them off, you just closed them all out. And then I guess the second prong of that is, you know, how concerned are you with, you know, your credit scores? I mean, if you have, you know, healthy safety nets and um, smart investments and you're saving for your future, um, you know, I I don't know. I guess I just want to know financially if, you know, you find credit cards necessary and are you concerned with your credit score with, you know, closing all these, close, you know, your um, consumer accounts and your credit cards? So, you guys don't use your credit cards. You hold on to your credit cards. Well, uh, you know, that's a pretty obvious answer to me. If you're not using them, um, then uh, then get rid of them. Andy, buddy, man, if you are someone who has gotten yourself into some massive credit card debt, uh, paying that off and then holding on to it for a rainy day, that doesn't sound like the best idea to me. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> the uh, I, I do understand that you do need some type of security, some some type of safety net. But Andy, I would encourage you to yes, cancel your credit card, and if you need something for a rainy day, then do what Erica has done and and uh, get a safety net. Um, Erica, yeah, I mean, you have a safety net that's bigger than your credit card limit. You don't need that credit card, I, absolutely not. I, I would say to both of these folks, uh, yeah. Cancel your credit cards. Um, Yeah, your credit score might go down for a little bit. Uh, But at the end of the day, if you are staying out of debt, you don't need a credit score. I I mean, I hope to one day have a zero credit score, just like uh, Dave Ramsey. Um, I'm not there yet, but... uh, but, but, But yeah, Josh and I are not super concerned on our credit scores. In fact, some people would argue, well, you should be concerned because what if you want to go rent a place? So Josh, what if you have a zero credit card score but you want to go rent a place like and a zero then, FICO score, right? Zero, zero how, score. how would you how would you prove that you could still rent a place without a credit score? Yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing. It's not actually a credit score; it's a debt score, and that, that's that's, <laughs> that's that, a good point. That, that's the problem we have. There are people who make ten thousand dollars a year, uh, which is not very much money. It's well below the poverty line. But you could have an eight hundred Beacon score because you've done all the the you've massaged the game so much that you have improved your credit score. But you know what? An apartment complex uh, or or a, a, a place that's going to rent you a house, they're not going to approve you to rent their home if you make only ten thousand dollars a year. The the way that that a 
that credit works is y- you are proving that you can you have the ability to go deeper into debt. So these aren't credit cards; they are debt cards. Mm. You don't have a credit score; you have a debt score. And you're saying, "But what? What if one day I want to get a car loan?" Well, you shouldn't want to get a car loan ever. You should never ever have a car loan. You should buy the car you can afford. If you need a car loan, you can't afford that car. By definition, yeah. Yeah, there, there's one exception here. I'm not going to yell at anyone who who gets a mortgage. Uh, 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 so so for me, for the last several years, I've thought about uh, buying or, or building a house potentially. Now, I'll tell you what I would do in, in terms of uh, of buying or building a house. I'd have to have at least 20% down for me. It's, it's got to be 50%, but at least 20% down uh, for, for the house. And I would do no more than a seven-year fixed rate mortgage. Now, we, we hear this all the time. That, yeah, well, it's a 30-year mortgage, fixed rate. And it's like, well, 30-year mortgage. I'm 35 years old. I, I'm going to pay on a mortgage till I'm 65. I wow. plan on living in the same house till I'm till I'm 65. Probably not. But even if I did, I don't want to make those payments till I'm 65 years old. So what we do right now is we we buy. I say buy in quotes here houses that we can't necessarily afford. It's just the bank gives us the uh, enough money because they assume we're going to be able to make payments on it and we're going to have that same income for the rest of our lives. Well, I have news for you. Uh, the average person changes careers seven times throughout mm-hmm. their lives now. It's not. It's not the same. Uh, it's not the same thing that we had thirty years ago, where you you went and you worked to a, in a factory and you retired with a pension at age you know, fifty or fifty five. It just doesn't work like that anymore. Mm. And so for me, yes, I, I would consider having a home mortgage if I was able to put 50% down to a seven-year uh, mortgage. I would do up to a, a 15-year mortgage. I wouldn't personally, but I, I wouldn't yell in, at anyone for, for doing that. But a 30-year mortgage, there's only two countries in the world that do that. Mm. And, and it's becoming more popular in some other countries. But it's only the standard in two countries now. But a lot of countries have seen that, oh, look, the banks in America let people do do this, so we're going to we're going to start offering that as an option as well. Do not get fooled. Do not get pulled into that. And by the way, if I needed a mortgage and I had a zero uh, credit score, it doesn't matter. It, you get something called underwriting. You find a a, a good cr- local credit union or a, a good local bank, a good local broker, and they do underwriting based on your income and your assets. And if you can afford a house then it's not a problem. Your credit score is literally irrelevant in that situation. You shouldn't worry about your credit score. The only time you want to worry about your credit score is if you just have a bad credit score. And a zero isn't a bad credit score. To me, that's perfect. It's like <laughs> it's like yeah, it's a no hitter in 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 baseball. And and so uh, the, if you if you have bad a bad credit score is an indication that you haven't been keeping up on your debts that you are in bad debt and you're not able to pay off those debts. And so I'm not worried about the score there. I'm worried about the debts that you have. And so uh, in summary, no, don't worry about your credit score. And credit cards, if you're in debt, you shouldn't have any credit cards at all. And as Ryan said, you definitely need a safety net. Even if you're in debt, you need a $500 to $1,000 safety net. I keep mine in a a separate account. I I use a a company called Betterment to do that. Uh, You could put it in a a separate checking account. You want to put it somewhere where it is difficult for you to get to that money. You don't want it sitting in your checking account. Oh, there's my my safety net. Because then, of course, you're going to spend it. Oh, I, uh, I, I need a new pair of shoes or whatever. I'll dip into my safety. Safety net. Safety net is for true emergencies and emergencies only. Once you're out of debt, you definitely want to have a, a much larger safety net. I have a six month safe, uh, safety net, and, and that means you know if the internet blows up or I stop making income for a while or, or whatever it may be, I have enough money to live off of for for six months. I didn't always have that, but after I paid off my debt, I built up a a safety net, so I would I would have uh, more security. Our next question is from Jonathan in Maryland. So I have credit card debt. Um, obviously, that's a higher interest debt, as well as student loan debt. Um, and something that I find hard to do is start to save or invest um, when I have this other debt. I feel like I should pay down all that debt before I can start saving any money for the future. Jonathan, uh, first off... 
congratulations on uh, making the steps towards paying off all of your debt. Um, right now, you need to have what Josh said in the previous question, a 500 to to $1,000 safety net. That should be goal number one before you invest into anything. That's for sure. And then, yeah, I would say right now, pay off all of that debt before you start to invest massive amounts of money into anything. Um, the debt should definitely get paid off first. I agree with Ryan. You, you don't want to make any investments, any long-term investments in retirement while you're still in debt. Your money should be going toward paying off debt. However, I can tell you what, what I did. I, I also built a investment muscle over the four years that I was paying off my debt. So I had about six figures worth of debt, and, and I really just laser focused on, on paying off that debt. In fact, if you want to see the, the exact plan that I used and then Ryan later used to pay off his debt as well, we wrote about it on our website. It's at theminimalists.com slash freedom. We'll put that in, uh, in the show notes there. Uh, it's called Financial Freedom, Five Difficult Steps to Get Out of Debt, Create a Simple Budget, Plan for the Future, and Regain Control of Your Finances. And, and it's five difficult steps for a reason. It's, it's definitely not, it is simple, but it is not easy. And, and so over those four years, I, I made sure that I was putting all the extra money I had uh, toward paying off debt. I mean, really, when you think about it, Ryan, there are there are three ways that we, three things we can do with our money. We can either save it, we can spend it, or we can give it. We can c- contribute beyond ourselves, right? And, and the only way to to get out of debt is we're basically making up for money we already spent that we didn't have. So in a way, paying off debt is spending money. Mm. And, and so what? What I had to do was put all my extra dollars in, uh, toward paying off my debt, but at the same time, I would dedicate a dollar a day, just a dollar a day, toward investing in my future. And I mean, let's face it, a dollar a day isn't a big investment. Uh, it's not going to make you rich in the long run, but what it did is it really develop that investing muscle. And I invest in index funds. Uh, If you want to see exactly how I invest all of my my retirement money now, and Ryan uses the same same formula here, um, you can go to theminimalists.com slash retirement. I invest it in uh, several different buckets, but up front, I would just put it into a, a wealth building bucket. Uh, I use a company, like I said before, called Betterment. You can go to a local broker as well, or you can go th- directly through Vanguard or, or other places. Uh, I, I just invest in basic indexed funds. And and by putting just a dollar a day in there, it didn't make me rich, but it, it over time conditioned me to continue to invest. That's and a that- great idea because everyone can afford a dollar a day, man. I mean, if you're buying a cup of coffee or if, if, if you're stopping at the, uh, the store to buy a pack of gum, like everyone is spending a dollar a day. Even if you're going to a coworker at the end of the day, if you don't have the dollar, you're like, hey, can I borrow a dollar? <laughs> I mean, dollar a day is, 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 not, is not the hardest thing in the world to save. And yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's a total, totally awesome uh, exercise to get people in the habit of, of saving money and investing for sure. And that's exactly what it was, an exercise yeah. so that... After I paid off all my debt, after those four years, and I became debt free and jumped up in the air and felt that freedom. You called Dave Ramsey up and you were like, I'm debt free! (laughs) Uh, Not exactly, but I felt that way. (laughs) And and I I mean, it just removed this huge anchor. And now I I dedicate 20% of, of my income. A minimum to to my investments, but that's because I already built that muscle. Now every single month, like clockwork, twenty percent of my income, and in the, in, at the end of the month, after I've budgeted for everything, if I have any money left over, I put that into my investments as well. And you can see the the four different buckets there over at theminimalists.com slash retirement. That article is a long article, but it's called a Retirement Planning: How to Plan for a Successful Retirement. And so, yes, Jonathan, you, you, you're not going to want to invest big time right now. You don't want to contribute a bunch of money to a 401k or a 403b or a Roth IRA or anything like that. What you want to do right now is pay off your debt. And at the same time, if you can just build a little bit of a muscle so that once you're out of debt, man, you're going you're gonna to be good to go. You're going to be saving for retirement or for a house or for whatever else you, you, you plan on saving for in the future. But right now... Stay laser focused, laser focused on paying off that debt. I think both of those those articles, long articles on our website, will help you. We'll put both of those in the show notes as well. 
Kim in Boston has a question for us. A little background. Um, I have $70,000 in federal loan debt and for a master's degree, which I used to get a job in the nonprofit sector, so working for an international development organization, so really doing what I love and feeling like I contribute to society, but for a low salary, which makes it really difficult to pay back that federal loan. So I wanted to know what you guys think about federal income-based repayment plan programs and loan forgiveness programs. I'm actually in one of these. Um, the one I'm in calculates my payments at 15% of my income. And generally, the forgiveness program works in after you make 25 years worth of payments, and they don't have to be consecutive, the government will forgive the rest of your loan. Now, there's also a piece if you work in the nonprofit sector like I do, so or, or in some sort of public service, uh, they will forgive your loans after 10 years worth of payments, so after 120 payments. Um, so this makes my payments manageable. Uh, the one little bit of concern I have, I'm locked into a 7.25% interest rate. So it's kind of scary when I see my loan statements that the principal is actually increasing over time because my my um, income-based repayment rate is not even touching the full interest. So I know if I stay in the nonprofit sector after 10 years, I'll get that loan forgiveness, but it's still a little, a little overwhelming. So I'm just kind of curious. I, it, it seems to me that this goes kind of counter to a lot of the advice you're giving around mortgages and whatnot where you don't want to be in locked into long-term plans. But if you're working in the nonprofit sector, you know, and this seems like a viable option, um, particularly if you have federal loans, you know, kind of what do you think about this? And then my particular situation, I mean, I can't take back the fact that <laughs> I went and got this master's degree, um, but this is how I'm dealing with it right now. You know, if if it is a loan that you have signed on the dotted line and that you've taken on, uh, you know, I would say pay back your loan at all costs. I mean, that that goes for anyone out there. Um, I don't think there is any, you know, any any uh, uh, justified way for anyone to just like stop making payments and to ignore a loan. There, there's no doubt about that. However. Uh, there are some times when people get their, themselves in a situation where she has a $70,000 student debt loan at a 7% interest rate. I was like doing the math on this before the podcast. Uh, just on the 70000 is $5,000 a year. That doesn't include compounded interest. So uh, th- th- so if she was just paying on the interest, it's like 400 bucks a month. So basically, uh, what I'm getting at is this loan is upside down at this point. So sometimes people get themselves in a situation where they can't pay back the loan. They're doing everything they can. They are making the payments, but they are unable to pay it back. And I would say that, yes, there are there are some government-funded, uh, subsidized programs in place that will forgive loans. Um, I know uh, people do this with, with mortgages where they can short sell a house to avoid bankruptcy. Um, I think those, those are in place for a reason. And, and I, I'm not saying that everyone should take advantage of those. Like I said, at the beginning of this answer, everyone should pay back a loan that they have agreed to take out on, on a certain interest rate. Now, maybe you can get that interest rate lowered. Uh, there are other ways to potentially pay back that loan without having a short sale. There are other ways, but sometimes there are not. And in those cases, I think that it's okay to take advantage of those programs that, that uh, help people to avoid bankruptcy. $70,000 in, in student loans. It's a ton. Uh, the average American uh, leaves college with uh, approaching 40000 now. Wow. Um, and, and in fact, I've, I've talked to a dentist who had $400,000 in student loans. Wow. And so you know, maybe, maybe we'll talk about that at some point. But there, there are basically two, two ways for you to pay off this, this debt, Kim. One is to spend less money, or two is to make more money. And, and I'm going to give you some examples. When I was uh, starting to pay off some of my debts, I delivered pizzas for Papa John's uh, several nights a week just to make some additional tips and income to pay toward my credit cards. Uh, I wish Uber would have been available then because I certainly would have just become an Uber driver. That, that aligns more with my values than delivering pizza. But, but, uh, but what I'm saying is there are other ways for you to make additional income, and you're going to have to scrimp and save because I don't want you to be tied to this debt. You, you mentioned the two programs. One was 25 years. One was 10 years. 
I don't want you to be tied to the $70,000 for the next decade. That mm. sounds crazy to me. I, I don't want you to have to go through that. It's so stressful. You don't want an anchor hanging around your neck for a quarter century or even for 10 years. And so I want you to find ways to bring more money in. Is there Are there other ways for you to use the degree that you got to make more money at, at, a, at a different company? Uh, if so, that's great. If not, what are you going to do in your free time, whether it's opening your own business or doing something on the side like Uber delivering pizza? Find a way for you to earn more income so you have the opportunity to to pay that off. And then, of course, if, if you have to leverage certain programs, I understand that. Uh, but, but you don't necessarily need to be tied to this debt in perpetuity. You're going to want to get on a budget. Uh, you can use an app like uh, Every Dollar, which is is a great app. I used to just do it on on paper, and uh, Mint.com is what I used back in the day because EveryDollar.com wasn't available yet. But you want to get on a very tight budget, and if you get on that budget and and you stay close to it, and you find some ways to make some additional income, you over the, I don't know how much money you're you're making right now, but I think over the course of a few years you'll be able to pay down a significant amount of this debt, not just the interest, but pay down a significant amount on on the principal, and that will really free you up. Kim, I'd love to send you a copy of one of our books as well. Since since you're in debt, I, I definitely don't want to charge you for a book. Um, we're gonna we're gonna give you a copy of Essential. It's a, a collection of 150 essays that Ryan and I have have written over the last five years about intention. Living, there are are twelve separate chap- chapters in there about different areas of life, and one of those chapters uh, is on finances. So I hope you find some value in that book, Kim. I hope you enjoy it. Our next question is from Merrill in New Mexico. I lost my job a few months ago, and my husband and I decided that I wouldn't work and be a stay-at-home mom. We are operating on my husband's income now, and I would like to implement the needs, wants, life strategy for budgeting that you mentioned. Um, I want to get out of debt and stay there. My husband, on the other hand, feels our debts of a car payment, mortgage, and low credit card bill are minimal compared to most people and doesn't want to change. Uh, how could I introduce him to your strategy, and do you have suggestions on how we can work together to eliminate our debt at a rate we'll both be happy with? Meryl, your husband is wrong, but you can't just go tell him that, obviously. And and so uh, the reason that, that you're having trouble communicating here is you're both talking about the what right now. You're talking about, I want to get out of debt, or I want to, to stay at home after I lost my job. Or, or I want to have these bills, I want to have these expenses. These are the what's. We need to talk about the why. Why do you want to be debt-free? Why, what anchors are you removing? What will that free up? Will it give you more time to, to stay at home? It sounds like you, you, want to be, uh, you, you want to stay at home. I don't know if you're a stay-at-home mother, but um, I'm going to recommend that you actually get a job until you pay off your debts. Right now, you're, if you're in debt, you, you, you want to be able to tackle that as quickly as possible, but you need to show your husband why that is so important. Financial freedom is going to allow you to travel more. What are your goals? How are you going to get on on the same page? Now, I know you you said your husband says that, well, our debt isn't that bad compared to most people. Well, yeah, if you compare yourself to most people, you're never going to be happy. In fact, I think comparison just by itself is uh, is dangerous, but Compared to most people, most people aren't happy. Most people are up to their eyeballs in debt. Most people aren't living a a meaningful life, and it's not because they don't want to. They certainly want to, but they feel trapped, and quite often they're trapped by this thing called debt. And so, yes, you definitely want to to get out of debt, and and you're going to need to have a discussion with with your husband. You need to get, you you're definitely going to need to get on a budget where you. You find a location for every single dollar that you bring in, and hopefully you'll both be working to bring in more dollars so that you can pay down that debt. Your budget then becomes a contract with your husband. It's also a contract with yourself, but you really can't start working on that contract until you get a clear reason why you want to do this. The what is the intellectual side of things, and intellectual the intellectual side of things does, doesn't explain much uh, in, in terms of 
of the why. The why is the emotion, that visceral feeling behind why you want to be debt-free. It's where you're going as opposed to where you are. And just real quick, you mentioned, Merrill, our need, want, like list. It's a, a budgeting tool that Ryan and I have used uh, to to be more aware of the money that we're, that we're spending. And so for those people who aren't aware of the need, want, like list, you can uh, just go to theminimalists.com slash want. We, we break it down for you. There's three different categories. You put all your expenses in, and I think, uh, I think that'll help other people out as well. Yeah, Meryl, uh, I'll, I'll talk about Mariah and I. Um, so Mariah is Ryan's partner, by the way. Yes, uh, M- Mariah and I were talking about her quitting her job. This was about eight months to a year ago. And I was like, you know, you can totally do this. Uh, let's let's talk about getting you debt free. Let's talk about, you know, getting a six month salary safety net put together. And, and uh, maybe you could uh, potentially quit your job. And uh, that was a common goal that we both kind of found that uh, we could both work towards because we, we wanted to be around each other more. She wanted to do more, uh, you know, she like, <laughs> she looks at me and she's like, man, I want to live that blog life, Ryan. I want to like, you know, be able to, you know, have, have, have freedom with my schedule, even though we work a ton, uh, you know, our schedule is, is pretty much ours to manage. So that's really, you know, what she wants to work towards is having, having a, a schedule on her own terms. And uh, she really, really wants that. So first I would say, Meryl, is find something that you and your husband both really, really want and, and, and use that as leverage to, to pay off debt and to work towards. And, and then, you know, it got to a point where uh, with Mariah, I, I just one day I was like, oh, wow, if she sells her car, that would like get rid of most of her debt already. In fact, that was her biggest debt. On, that was on, on it was the only course. debt she had left. Oh, wow. okay. Yeah, so I'm like, man, if she could sell her car, she she would be debt free. Oh, by the way, uh, she's been making double payments on her car, so then she'd have a few thousand dollars on top of, uh, you know, after paying off the debt, she'd have a few thousand dollars to put away in the savings. And long story short, I went to her and I'm like, Mariah, you could sell your car. We can go down to one car. And, and you could even get there faster. And her initial reaction was, no, I don't want to sell my car. Like car, a car, especially in Montana, uh, it equals freedom in, in a lot of cases. Um, you can get around Missoula really, really well um, w- without a car. Um, outside of Missoula, it's very, very difficult to get anywhere um, if you don't have a car. So she didn't want to like give up this personal freedom. But then as time went on, and it wasn't that much time, just a couple weeks, maybe a month, where she started to realize like, oh yeah, if I sell my car, I can quit my job a lot sooner. So uh, she literally just sold her car last week. So the job was the pain point there. Yeah. It was more pain than getting rid of the car, it sounds like. Exactly. So so she, she uh, sold her car last week and basically was able to put a huge chunk of change into savings. She doesn't have that six months yet. Uh, but she will have that six month salary saved up by the end of August, and that is when she will she will quit her job. So her, so her she has a plan. Yeah, so she's got a plan. So what what, what I'm getting at is is that um, you know Mariah didn't want to give up her car, uh, <laughs> and then saw the benefits of giving up her car, saw the benefits of getting you know of 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 uh, leaving that huge pain point of her job. And and all of a sudden that moved her to yes let's go down to one car now the car that she had it was a uh, it was like a Chevy HHR like not a super you know nice car but it it was a nice ride I mean much nicer than my 2004 Toyota Corolla I think it's her, hers was like a 2010 or 2012 something like that but it had a uh, you know uh, you know a sunroof that didn't leak <laughs> it had um, heated pleather seats yes it did have heated seats man it was awesome so like there was all these like luxury uh, you know amenities. Amenities? Am I saying that right? Yes. <laughs> I had all these amenities that that she really enjoyed. Um, however, once we were able to find a goal that 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 equaled more pleasure than the pleasure of her car, she was able to kind of turn that corner. So find something that you that y'all have in, in common. If it, whether it's 
you know, big time vacation or whether it's, you know, traveling the world for a year or whatever it may be, just find something, try to find something that you both can work towards uh, that that includes uh, paying off your debt. Totally agree with that. We, we do things for two reasons, either for pain or pleasure. So find find both in, in the situation, Meryl. Find the, the pain points that are their pain points for both of you. And, and then find the pleasure that you are both going to work toward together. And then if you want a, an additional perspective, Meryl, and, and maybe your husband does too, we'd love to uh, give you... So our, our documentary is coming out on August 2nd online. Uh, and, and so we'd love to send you a, a copy of that when it does come out on, online. And there's six hours of bonus content with, uh, with the Vimeo. Um, order there. So we're going to give that to you for free and maybe you two can sit down together and watch that and find a bunch of different perspectives. There's a bunch of different people in this documentary who are living a meaningful life with less. We have uh, minimalist families, minimalist entrepreneurs, minimalist architects and artists and and writers. And but we also interviewed uh, neuroscientists and neuropsychologists and journalists and even a former Wall Street broker and a bunch of different perspectives on how to live a meaningful life with less. So we'd, we hope you enjoy that film and maybe you and your husband can watch it together and, and get some value out of it and find all of these different perspectives. And of course, we'd love to hear what you all have to say about money. If you have a comment uh, about money or, or, or debt or budgeting or minimalism tips for how to handle debt and pay off debt and invest, then leave us a voicemail at 406-219-7839. We'll air our favorite comments and tips on a future episode. All right, let's move on to our hashtag Ask the Minimalists lightning round, where we answer questions from social media. We're on Twitter and Instagram at The Minimalists and Facebook.com slash The Minimalists. All right, our first question is from Kenneth. What advice would you offer a grad student who is barely breaking even and is trying to pay for a simple wedding? Kenneth, I'm going to be honest with you, brother. If you guys can't afford your wedding, you might not be ready to get married. And I'm mm. not saying that to be mean. I'm just, I'm just being honest, man. Now, let's say you're in a situation where uh, it's religious reasons. So, like, you're living in sin and, you know, you feel like you got to get married to avoid living in sin. Uh, then go get eloped. You don't have to have a wedding. The, the, the marriage is not about other people. The marriage is about you. So, um, so again, if, 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 you are, uh, if you're not religious and there's no reason to get married right now, I would say hold off on the wedding. And, and that's uh, take, take it or leave it. That's my, that's my advice. Uh, if you are someone who is, like I said, needing to get married for religious reasons or some other you know, major reason that you have to get married, you got to get on somebody's insurance or whatever it may be, then go get eloped and then have the party later. Uh, but but I, I always find it funny how people, they get in debt over weddings, over one day a year, they will go into thousands and thousands of dollars of debt mm-hmm. so they can impress their friends and family. Thirty to $50,000 quite often. It's, Good God. It, it, it's amazing. And so I, I completely agree with what Ryan's saying here. And if you're going to have a wedding, a simple wedding, remember who the wedding's for. It's for you. It's not to impress your friends or, or, or family. It should be what you want, and you also need to be ready for it, and, and that means you need to be able to afford it. When I uh, bring a new purchase into my life, I ask two questions. Can I afford it, and does this add value to my life? And I would encourage you to ask those same questions with, with your wedding. Can I afford it right now? Meaning, am I going to go into debt? If so, then no, you can't afford it. Uh, and, and believe me, I, I, I got married when I was young, and uh, we had a, a fairly elaborate wedding. Ryan remembers he was in the wedding party, and we had a stretch Hummer at one point. And it was just, Good God, we did have a stretch Hummer. How absurd was that? <laughs> Good grief. And we spent a ton of money, and, and my former spouse, she's a wonderful woman, and, and she wanted this elaborate wedding. Her dad actually helped pay for some of it, but her parents are both factory workers. They didn't have a lot of money. And so we ended up just taking on the debt. We put it on credit cards and a bunch of other stuff. That was wow. part of our six figures worth of debt was, was building up this elaborate wedding. And so you're, I'm sorry, you were married for how many years? Uh, I was with her for eight, married for six. Okay, married for six years. When you were divorced, you were still paying off the wedding. That is true. Wow, that that is absolutely true, and and that's wow. That is 
That, that that's insane. Enlightening. Man. Yeah, it really is, man. <laughs> I, when, when you think about uh, about the ceremony itself, lasts something like sixteen minutes, and and so it's not a this. A lot, and then you have, of course, a celebration or whatever afterwards. Who's the celebration for, though? It's for you, dude. I don't mean to be a jerk right now, uh-huh. but I besides like taking pictures outside the stretch Hummer, uh-huh. like we would have to like have a conversation for you to really jog my memory of the wedding. Yeah, like I really don't remember the reception. I barely remember being in the church. No, I I I remember I, it being beautiful. I I remember I, not, not that I, it wasn't I, memorable. I'm in the same <laughs> position as you, man. Yeah, I I don't remember a whole lot of it. Like I remember showing up and like having a tuxedo yeah, on. I barely remember my own wedding too. Yeah, and, yeah wow. Well. Yeah, so um, yeah, uh, the wedding is is for you if if you're going to have it, and and, and just keep that in mind. We're not there to impress others. All right, our next question is from Leho. I'm finally debt free. Congratulations. Yay. Woo. Please guide me on how to go about investing in the stock market. Please give me some beginner's tips. Well, I say put all your money in Enron. <laughs> 1990s <laughs> joke. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. And for those of you who haven't seen the, the big short, uh, it didn't have to do with, with Enron necessarily, but the, the financial collapse of, of 2008, that was, that was a great film. Uh, that uh, shows us what not to invest in. So let, let's talk about h- how to invest your money. So well, let's go back to the uh, retirement planning article, uh, which is the minimalists.com slash retirement. And I'm going to sort of guide you through some retirement or some investing principles, really, because that's what we're investing in. We're investing in the future. As I mentioned earlier, there are three things you can do with your money. You can spend your money, you can save your money, you can contribute. I'll tell you the order that I do it in. I save first. So if I if I make $100, I save at least $20, and then I contribute. If I make $100, I give at least $10. It's generally more than that. And then I have the other 70% to live off of. And generally, I, I have plenty left over to invest and to contribute beyond myself. But we're really talking about that saving part. We're saving for the future, whether that's to, to buy a house one day or for retirement, etc. I, I invest my money in index funds. And the reason that I prefer index funds over mutual funds is the stock market tends to outperform about 90 plus percent of mutual funds. So an index fund like the S&P 500 is is a really good place to start. I use a company called uh, Betterment, and you can see exactly how I invest my money into uh, different uh, different buckets. But I want to really go through right now, there are seven retirement myths that I wrote about in that retirement article. And these are really seven investment myths as well. So myth number one, I'm too old to save for retirement. And so I I remember that back in the corporate world, I I frequently hired employees who were older than I was. You know, I was in my 20s and often hired people in their 30s, 40s, 50s even sometimes. And, uh, And a lot of these people had no retirement savings plan. And I think fear had long ago set in in their lives, and they figured, it, oh, it's just too late for me. I am stuck. I missed my opportunity to invest in the stock market. And, man, nothing could be farther from the truth. Uh, while it's true that you're better off starting at age 25 than uh, if you were age 50, it's also true that you're better off starting at 50 than age 70. And you're better off starting at age 70 than at age 90. The past is the past, and we must stop looking in that rearview mirror and instead start looking toward the horizon, and that's what investing is going to do for you. So as long as you're still breathing, it's, uh, it's never too late to start investing. It's never too early either, of course. So myth number two is I'm too young to save for retirement. For retirement. Too young? Are you crazy? Like, if you're younger than 30 years old, which Ryan and I aren't, uh, then man, you have it made. Young people, no, no matter your tax bracket, have a significant opportunity to become truly wealthy, thanks to the power of compound interest. Ryan mentioned compound interest earlier with respect to the debt mm-hmm. that, that this woman had on her college loan. That's the wrong kind of compound interest. But if you're investing your money, you get compound interest on that, that money that you're investing. So let me give you an example here. Uh, someone who invests $25,000 by age 25 
uh, with a 12% rate of return, will have more than $2 million saved by age 65. That's without adding another dollar after age 25. Wow. Now, if you do that at age 50, you're not going to have as much money because compound interest uh, re- really is on your side. And that, the, the, the 12%, that is like the average rate of return on the, on the uh, stock market. Yeah, right? yeah. So, so we'll go over some, we can go over some percentages here in a moment. 12 is a, is a little bit better than the average, mm-hmm. but we can even adjust those numbers and say, okay, what if you get just the average, which is 11% or mm-hmm. just over 11%, I believe. Uh, over a long period of time. Now, yeah. last year, the stock market lost. Uh, I lost a, uh, about 2% on my investments last year. Mm. But over the course of the last eight years, I more than doubled my investments. Right, right. And so it's important to realize that, yes, the stock market is going to be volatile at times. There will be downturns. But we're talking over a long period of time. So that same person, conversely, uh, if, you, if, if you instead of wait till age 25, you wait till age just age 30. He or she will have contributed. Uh, will have to contribute more than three times that much. So twenty five thousand or seventy five thousand at age thirty. Well, Ryan and I will both be thirty five this year, and so it's going it would be even harder for us at that point. So no, you're never too young. In fact, when you're young, it's absolutely uh, the, the the best time to do that. I mean, I think the lesson is that compound interest is the best way to grow your money over the long haul. So start while you're young if you can. And uh, myth number three, we'll move on to that. I don't make enough money to save for retirement. And really what you're saying there is I don't make enough money to invest in my future self. Mm. Wow. So actually, uh, there's no reason you shouldn't retire a millionaire. What? I, I was telling Becca this when we first met, and she, she actually got – people get a visceral reaction to this. So my partner, Bex, it, because it sounds crazy. Most of us aren't millionaires. Right. I'm not a millionaire. Ryan's not a millionaire. I don't know about Sean. I don't know what he's doing over there. But I, I'm guessing he's not a millionaire. Um, but there's no reason that every single one of us shouldn't retire as a millionaire. I, I, literally, virtually everyone in the Western world, even minimum wage earners, Everyone has the opportunity to be a millionaire when they retire. And I know that sounds too good to be true, but uh, the math, it proves otherwise. And so, again, a 25-year-old who sets aside only $23 per week, 23 bucks a week, will retire with more than $1 million uh, if the money is, is invested uh, uh, appropriately, so a twelve percent rate of return there, and again, so twenty five year old. Sorry, uh, just explain this to me a little bit. So twenty five. Let's year say old, you're twenty five years old, and I start putting twenty three dollars a week right now. Mm-hmm. I'll be a millionaire by the time I, by the time I'm sixty five. Yes. Wow, that is correct. And so uh, maybe you're not twenty five anymore, though. Me either. Maybe you're thirty five. Like Josh is going to be later this month. Yeah, actually, when this this airs, it'll be tomorrow. Oh, we'll talk about that in a second. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's okay. I mean, us older folks, we simply need to adjust accordingly. And it's not going to be twenty three dollars per week, but everyone at age twenty five has the opportunity to to become a millionaire. And even beyond that, you just have to invest more per, per week. And if you don't have the money, like I said earlier, you can find other ways to get income, whether it's delivering pizza or it is driving for Uber or finding a, a higher paying job, or learning a skill set, starting your own business. I and mean, one of the best things Ryan and I ever did was was leave the corporate world because it gave gave us the freedom to start our own business and, and and yes we work a lot as as Ryan mentioned but we're in control of our own destiny now you know before someone else was writing our paycheck and we could be fired in a day we could you know, the company could go on in fact we were talking about this on on last week's podcast Ryan we we I said you know I'm about to turn 35 and my plan was to be a senior VP by age 35 right mm-hmm. Well, think about that. If I would have stuck that plan out, I w- that wouldn't have actually happened because the division that we worked for was acquired by a larger company, and everyone oh, there yeah. was essentially um, right-sized. Yes. I think, I think that's the appropriate HR term. <laughs> Reappropriated to... <laughs> Reappropriated <laughs> to other companies. <laughs> uh, yeah. So Actually, no, I had a, a, a boss one time, one of my, my uh, favorite mentors. He, when he would let go of someone, he said he promoted them to the marketplace. Good God. Um, but uh, you know, it, so here, here's here's the thing. Um, you, you want some sort of. I don't know how old you are, obviously, 
but you need a, a investment and retirement calculator. Uh, if you go to theminimalists.com slash retirement, there's a link to one in there as well. Uh, let's go through these other myths really quickly. Myth number four, inflation will hurt my investment nest egg. Uh, this is the only myth that, that's actually partially true. However, uh, the truth is irrelevant in this case. While it's true that $100 10 years from now will probably possess less buying power than $100 today, the flip side of that coin is also true and considerably more important. Your $100 10 years from now will be worth infinitely more than your friend's $0 that he invested. Amen. In fact, solid investments are the only way to outpace inflation. Some people are like, what if I buy gold or I... Gold makes about 2% a year on average and is really volatile. It's, it's not something I would ever do. I would never uh, buy commodities, <laughs> in, in fact. And so that doesn't even outpace inflation most years. And so um, it's better to invest your $100 now uh, than it is to keep it in the bank or under your mattress. Now, you might say, I invested my $100 and then the stock market goes down 2% this year. Now I have only $98. That's true. And sometimes you, you start investing at the wrong time. Mm-hmm. And, and that happened to me. 2008, I lost half of my my uh, net worth in uh, my 401k, basically. Yeah. And and I it took me another six six or so years to to get that back, and then eventually start making more money on top of that. You know, it's funny. Like when when the stock market goes down, like last year, you know, everyone lost two percent on if they were invested in index funds. Uh-huh. I just look at it like, oh wow, I should buy more index funds. The stock market is on sale right now. Yes, that's exactly what we should look at. It. But our emotions don't let us do that. Oh no, uh, uh, there's a ten percent dip in the stock market. Great, the stocks just went on sale ten percent, mm-hmm. and, and I think that's a way, way to do it. I don't invest in individual stocks. We could talk about that in a moment. Uh, let's talk about myth number five first, though. N- number five: I'd rather spend my money on something else instead of investing. Well, I get it, and intentions are good, and and I think this excuse it occasionally sounds like one of the most compelling reasons to invo- to avoid saving for for your future. And I think it's true that sometimes we selfishly cling to money. Uh, we use our income to purchase like all of these these trinkets and shiny objects and the the uh, what trophies of ostensible success, basically new cars and 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 new electronics and all the accoutrements of of consumerism. But frequently, we want to use our money also to contribute beyond ourselves to charities and nonprofits and, and of course, to loved ones in need. And I think contribution to others is certainly admirable. And uh, you know, I believe, ultimately, you know, it's the reason we live. Giving is, is living. So, of course, I want you to contribute generously. But I've also found that the best way uh, to help others is to help yourself first. The best way to give generously is to have more to give, right? And so investing in yourself first helps you flex your own giving muscle. There's a reason that airlines tell you to secure your own oxygen mask before helping others, right? If it's easier for you to breathe, it's easier for you to help others in need. Uh, myth number six is the stock market isn't safe. Oh, no. Translation you don't understand the stock market. And that's okay. I don't completely understand uh, the stock market either. Not intimately, anyway. I'm not a financial advisor, nor do I play one on the internet or on a podcast. The only people who must have an advanced understanding of the stock market and all of its intricacies are stockbrokers and day traders and, and people like fund managers. And I think rather than allocating several hours a day to learn the nuances of mutual funds and index funds and individual stocks, I personally, uh, I, I choose to use an investment service that, that basically takes the guesswork out of it. And uh, I think it's true that any in investment is going to introduce risk to the equation for you. But in the long term, the stock market has proven to be by far the best way to grow your investment and retirement savings. Uh, over the last 25 years, including the, the 2008 uh, steep decline and the, the subsequent Great Recession, the market has averaged a rate of return of nearly 11%. 
even when you account for two uh, for 1929's Great Depression, so about a hundred years ago now, the market has averaged greater than nine percent growth over the over the past hundred years, and, and so even during the Great Depression, if you average that in, it's nine percent. Uh, which is way better than inflation, way better than you know, the the one percent you're going to get in your savings account or whatever it may be. Way better than gold. Yes, way better than gold, and we, we should probably talk about that at some point. Um, so investing in the stock market is actually the most stable, good growth investment one can make in the long term, uh, especially when using online tools uh, like Betterment or there are other ones out there as well um, that. They really help you outperform the market in many ways and do things like tax loss harvesting. I don't even really know how to do that, but uh, a firm uh, like like Betterment does that for us. So uh, yeah, I don't even know what it is really. I just get an email. It's like, hey, you just made two hundred dollars on tax harvest. Tax harvest. What is it? Again? Tax loss harvesting. Tax loss harvesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm like so- great. <laughs> It, it, basically, they're 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 constantly rebalancing your portfolio, so you're not spending hours a week trying to do it yourself. And again, this isn't just a, a plug for Betterment. There are other ones out there as well. You can find a a, a local broker uh, as well. And the final myth that I have here, myth number seven: I don't have enough time or knowledge to manage my retirement savings. It's true that you and I will will likely never have as much financial wis- wisdom as as the experts, the people you see on like Fortune magazine or, or, or whatever. But that's precisely why we must seek out tools that help us uh, invest our money. You know, tools that are that are developed by trusted, reputable experts. And so, whether you're going with with Betterment or or your local broker, find someone who you can help leverage to to help you invest appropriately. For sure, uh, I think. Uh, the reason I use online investing tools is, is they allow me to control my money without being overtly controlling. Like I, I think it's a bad idea to log in every day and see how the stock market's do, doing. I'll go on about twice a year. Talk about a roller coaster, man. Yeah, you, you'll just get your emotions up. And, and, and an investment should never be a emotional exercise. This mm-hmm. should be a hundred percent intellectual exercise. This is the what side of things. Yeah. And you'll understand the why. That's the emotion. Like I want to be able to to have security in retirement. And, and so. Yes, you you want to invest your your money wisely. I recommend index funds, and you can find all the index funds and everything that I invest in. And Ryan uses the same formula as me over at theminimalists.com slash retirement. And before we, we, we before we wrap up this question, I, I do want to talk about uh, five investments to to avoid real quick. So. Uh, whether you use any of, of our tactics or not, I, I would definitely be remiss if, if I didn't at least warn you about these these investments to avoid. Uh, number one, cash value life insurance. Cash value plans such as, as whole life or universal life are horrible, horrible investments. Life insurance should not be treated as an investment. It must be treated as what it is. It's insurance. Your car insurance isn't isn't uh, an investment, right? Your health insurance isn't an investment. Um, and so if you have dependents, then yes, I, I strongly recommend you do have life insurance uh, unless you are wealthy enough to self-insure. And even then, it's, it often makes sense because it's relatively inexpensive to get uh, term life insurance. So you want to find good term life insurance. Do not let anyone sell you any life insurance that isn't term life insurance. And if you're quote, invested in other types of life insurance, I would find a way to get out if, if, if I were you. Uh, number two, individual stocks. Unless you are an expert day trader, individual stocks pose way too much risk to the average investor. You may want to do it for fun sometimes or, or whatever if you're completely out of debt and, and you want to give it a spin to you know buy Google stock or something like that. Uh, but, but the truth be told, even if your employer offers a, a quote, special rate for their stock, I would not invest any of my money into a single stock, not even reputable stock, stocks like Apple or, or Google with, with good performance. It's simply too high risk for my taste. And so I want my money to grow over time, and I prefer to get rich slowly instead of get rich quick because get rich quick is a good way to go broke. Quick. Go broke quick? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and so... 
uh, you know, there, there, there's usually just a bad outcome with trying to get rich quick. And so keep that in mind. I don't invest in individual stocks just because I don't have the know-how. Uh, number three? Yeah, I uh, I have uh, invested in some, like, in Tesla and, like, SpaceX. Because mm-hmm. I, I do believe in those guys. Sure. But I do view it as entertainment. Yeah, and also, like, in, a, in a weird way, because you believe in it, it's also contribution, right? Because yeah. you're yeah. like, how do I contribute to this cause that I believe in? Right. And one way to do it is yeah. to, to buy. But I have lost my ass on it over the last year. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's even more of a roller coaster than the index funds. Well, th- there you go. Yeah. Uh, so number three is gold, silver, and precious metals. So we talked about this a little bit. But like individual stocks, these metals are fraught with just way too much risk, especially when you compare them to index funds. And even worse, gold and silver, just like oil, are they're commodities. And commodity prices are are manipulated by speculation and by some uh by by if you look at a chart like you look at a, a commodities chart here's oil here's here's gold it's all spikes all over the place right. it's not like the stock market where it's fairly steady there are obvious spikes during yeah uh, you'll see some stair steps or whatever right but if you look at gold it's it looks like a heart rate monitor right it's up and down and up and down and and, and it doesn't really tie with actual supply and demand and I know some people, some conspiracy theorists, are, are really worried about, well, uh, the U.S. dollar is is, um, is is going to go go to hell. And well, if you look over the last two hundred years, the 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 best way to invest has been in the stock market, and, and a lot of that has to do with the U.S. dollar. And gold, just like the the green paper that we use, is basically. Uh, I mean, there's no intrinsic value in any of it. It has value because we give it value. Exactly. Whether that's gold or silver or, or paper money, it's or the, because yeah. we give it value. Right. You you cannot go to the whole to Whole Foods right now with your bar of gold. No, and they would try laugh to buy at you. some food. Yeah, right? they would have, have no idea what to do with your gold. Exactly. Number four, you do not want to invest in annuities, uh, variable annuities, or, or really any annuity for that matter. Uh, they are are generally not a good investment, especially since there are so many other great investment options out there. Uh, more often than not, annuities are rife with fees and penalties and surrender periods, not to mention pretty crappy rates of return. So I think those are kind of yucky. Uh, it's another reason that I use an online firm like Betterment is the fees are pretty darn close to zero. Your average broker, local broker, is going to charge you about 300 basis points, which Mm -hmm. is 3%. Uh, A lot of online firms are going to charge you about 15 basis points, so 15 versus 300 basis points. And and that's because they eliminate a a lot of the the middlemen, so to speak. And and last, uh, the other thing you shouldn't, you should not invest in are are just low interest yielding investments. If you're investing for for greater than five years, then low interest yielding investments such as CDs, saving accounts, individual bonds, and things like that, they're poor investments because the interest earn usually uh, it doesn't outpace inflation. But yeah, sometimes bonds or, or just a savings account or whatever they can be great options if you're going to to save for fewer than uh, five years. Uh, if you want to reduce your your overall risk, looks like Ryan. I think we have one more question here. All right, our last question is from Ruben. Which debts do you view as justified and which are not? For example, mortgage, student loans, credit cards. Man, the word justified. I, I like how, I love how this question is worded. Yeah, I usually don't I say a that's very, a good question because yeah. I, I think we, we usually say that to either be patronizing or or because we're trying to buy more time. But in, in this case, the the wording there. Yeah, justified. I think it's great. Also, though, I think justify could be a double-edged sword, man. Oh, yes. Because here's the thing. It's like, let me talk. So let me just talk you through your scenario. I am a college graduate. Uh, I have no car. I just got a new job in, you know, wherever, Peora, Peoria, Illinois. I've, I, I, I am moving into a new apartment, and I got to get a car. So this is where, like, you know, people justify getting into debt to get a car. Now, I think that, you know, let's say that this person that I'm talking about has zero savings and there's no way that they can uh, get, you know, spend a thousand or two thousand dollars on a um, of their own money or, or get money of their own uh, to spend on some kind of, you know, junker or something like that to get them from point A to point B. Um, yeah, you know, I think there is a justification here to say, okay, I've got to go get a car in order to uh, get to my job um, so I so I can, you know, start living my life. The problem is when people justify, well, I got to get a car. 
Um, and they don't go out and get a two thousand dollar loan for a junker. Mm-hmm. They go out and they get a twenty five thousand dollar loan because oh. they're like, oh well, you know, my car. It's I'm in it two hours a day, and my I gotta clients have, are going to see my, my car. clients are going to see, it and I got to have those heated seats, and I got to have that CD player. It's got to be a comfortable ride for my commute. And you know, I would say, yeah, you got to have a car for your, if you, if you got to commute, you got to have a car. Um, but no, you don't need the heated seats. No, you don't need the CD player. No, you do not need to get into $25,000 worth of debt, uh, justifying it because this is what you use, um, the, to to get to, from point A to point B or to get to your job. Yes. I do think that you can justify, uh, getting into some debt here, uh, but don't let the justification, uh, uh, let you go away above and beyond your, um, your means. If I can sum up this whole episode today, sum it up with eight words, it would be, there is no such thing as good debt, right? And, and so let's talk about this real quick. There, for me, there are two cases where I could justify debt. It doesn't mean that's going to be good, because if it was good, I would just try to get more of it, right? It, but there are two cases where I could justify it. Again, if there was a mortgage where I could pay, uh, put down at least 20%, for me, it'd be 50%, and have no greater than a, a 15-year uh, uh, fixed rate mortgage. For me, I wouldn't do any any greater than seven years personally. Uh, that or a medical emergency. If you have a medical emergency, and, and of course, there's going to be some sort of debt tied to that. But ideally, you have a, a safety net. So you're not going you so you'll at least be able to cover it if you have a safety net once you've paid off your debt. So even then, you're, ge- you're generally going to have some sort of health insurance, and you're going to have enough money to cover that medical emergency in your uh, safety net fund. Otherwise, no, I can't justify any debt. Even that $2,000 car, I-, I would bet you there's a way that you, you can find to-, to get around that. So there are very rare cases where any debt is, is justified. Ryan, I'd like to try something different right now since it's my birthday tomorrow. Okay. Um, I'd like to do a rapid fire round of questions. We had a bunch of questions come in last night for some reason about okay. about debt. Okay. So I haven't read any of these questions. You haven't read any of these questions. And then I'm just going to give my birthday rapid fire response. And if you have anything to add to it, <laughs> okay. if you're good with that. Yeah, go for it, man. Colleen asks, advice for merging households, getting married when one of you has no debt, me, and the other has $40,000 in debt. Well, Colleen, you are a bit mistaken. There, there's a crack in your logic here. His debt becomes our debt when you get married. So I need you to treat it that way. It, it, once you're merging your household, uh, you're going to want to merge your checking accounts. You don't want separate money. And you're also going to want to budget safely together. Well, I will say that maybe they do want some like separate savings, maybe. But for all intents and purposes. I disagree. For all intents, Let's talk pr- about it. So you think Mariah should put her uh, six month safety net into my Betterment account? If you decide to get married, I, absolutely not. Not until you your... think I should have access to to that six month safety net. I, I think that if you're married, yeah, absolutely you should. If you're joining your households together, is that like and... is that like a as a like a, f- a fail safe? Like if the other one dies, like you have access to it, and you don't have to go through getting yeah, access y- to their account. Yeah, yeah, I could you, see that. You, you would want to have access to it, but but you also want so to set up. Ma- rules. Ryan and I are never going to get married though, so. Then there's no reason for me to have access to her accounts. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, but but they're they're merging their households here, and and they're gonna want the same checking account, and basically you just don't want to hide money from each other. Of course not. And, and that that's really where I'm going here is is you you do not want to hide money. Your money becomes our yeah. money when when you're getting married. So your checking account sh- should be combined. Otherwise, I mean the, the two things people argue about are what. Sex and money, mm. and it's money over sex usually. That's so terrible. <laughs> it really is. And so the way to avoid that, have a budget every month. Mm-hmm. Realize this is now our money. It's not his debt anymore. It is also yours. It's yours together. Emma asks about UK student debt. It's completely different from the US and is the only logical way to go to university for most people. Oh, wow. Emma, that's bullshit. Well, it is with that idea, or with that attitude. Yeah, yeah. I mean, here, here's the here's the thing, Emma. Um, you can go. I mean, there are there are countries. Uh, God, I forget the name of the freaking country, but there are countries where you can go to school for free. Like you got to move there, you got to live there. Yeah, I mean, you know, even sp- if you're an outsider, so, so if places like Denmark, and, and, and yeah, even like if you're a foreigner, like you can go to school for free. Emma, I think we both realize that. You're well. You're not lying to me necessarily. You're you're really lying to yourself at this point. The the 
uh, student debt is debt. It's not de- U.S. debt isn't different from U.K. debt. Okay, maybe it's in pounds versus dollars, but debt is debt. And there are plenty of people in the United States. I, I mentioned earlier. I, I know. So I know two dentists. This is this is a really interesting um, dichotomy between these two dentists. One dentist who who left school with four hundred thousand dollars worth of debt. Four hundred thousand. Wow. I know another dentist who also left uh, once he got out of university with zero dollars in debt. And so I talked to him about how, how did he do that. And he saved up money working throughout out the process. So he paid off some of it. He also um, worked for the, the government for a period of time. Mm, that helps. So, so that they paid a significant portion. Mm-hmm. And then to, to make up for the, the money, the gap there, instead of taking out loans, he worked for the university, and they gave him a stipend for, for classes. Mm-hmm. And, and my point is, whatever you're trying to do, it looks like Emma wants to be a nurse in, in her previous tweet here. Um, you know what? There are nurse, All you have to do is find a nurse or two and fig- who, who got out of school without debt. No, that's a, that's a Follow good... Follow their template. No, that's a good that's good advice, man. Because, yeah, I, I guarantee you there are nurses in the UK who have went through nursing school and left with zero debt. Absolutely. That, that's And that's all you have to do. You, it, otherwise, you're not being completely truthful with yourself. You, you're using words like it's completely different. It's the only logical way. No, it's the only illogical way to get through university. Because here's the thing. If you get out without any debt, you're going to make a pretty darn good income. In the United States, the average, the average nurse is going to make upwards of $90,000. That's pretty amazing, but not if you have a crippling amount of debt. So let that debt go, and you're going to, you're going to be on the way to living an a amazing life where you can contribute to others, you can save for your retirement, and you, you can live within your means very comfortably. Maxine says... What do you think about borrowing for real estate investment? Renting to someone that pays the debt for you? Well, um, I think real estate can be an investment. I don't think your own house is an investment. So, so let, me, let me delineate here. Your own house, unless you have it completely paid off, is an expense. You're paying to live there. And there are other expenses involved with any real estate. Broken water heaters, uh, air conditioning units, the roof starts to leak. They're all, and so it's not, it's not good news when you have these. And so if you have debt hanging over your head, it's, it's certainly not an investment. And so having investment properties is great if you can afford them. You can afford them if you can pay for them. If you have to take out a mortgage, it's not an investment. It's, it's debt. And so please keep that in mind. And then your own property, it's, it's your expense. And I would treat it as an expense since you have it completely paid off. But I think real estate for some people, if, if you have a knack for, for real estate, I certainly wanna, wouldn't want to be a landlord. But no. one of my best friends is a landlord. He has 20 properties. Right. And he loves it. He yeah. goes to cuts the grass and everything. Loves yeah. It. Like, I, I know people who they've done exactly what she's talking about. Like They will find a uh, you know, a, a house in foreclosure, they get a really good deal on it. Um, they take out a loan. Uh, they don't put, you know, hardly any down payment down. They take out a loan to pay for the really good deal. And then they will get renters uh, to go in there and rent the property. And they'll maybe charge them, you know, 100 or $200 more than what the mortgage is. So I do see that as an investment. But like, I would never do that personally, because I know what it is like to be a landlord, and it is stressful as hell. Yes. So for I would, you and for me, right? Exactly. But there are some people out there, like like Jamar, yeah, Jamar, he, he yeah, who absolutely loves it. loves it. So uh, could that be an investment? Yes. Um, it, it would it, for me it would be a very stressful investment, and for anyone, there is the potential of it uh, of it being a risky investment too, right? Because you know Omar's got twenty five properties, so um, if one tenant leaves and he's got one place vacant, that's not that big of a deal. But if you're someone who buys one house right. and you take out a you know two hundred thousand dollar loan and you're paying twelve or thirteen hundred dollars a month on that, and uh, you got a you know a tenant who moves out. You have a potential of having, you know, a six month gap or before you find another tenant. So there's still a level of risk there that you need to need to be concerned with. And, and, and the nice thing about about Jamar and his case is he he owns about twenty properties now, and he never buys a new property that he can't pay for in cash. Yeah, 
And, and that's the best way to do it. And he's in Cincinnati, Hands and down. it's relatively inexpensive for him to get properties where he gets them. And then he 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 spends the sweat equity fixing them up himself. He'll he'll take a fifty thousand dollar house and turn it into a hundred and twenty, hundred and fifty thousand dollar house when he's done with it. Wow. But he puts in the effort to do that. Right. And he so he pays the money up front and then he pays for the construction. And he does it very slowly. He's been doing this for several decades now to get to twenty properties. And then when he feels good about it, he'll add a twenty first property and then a twenty second property. And Guess what? He owns all these properties. He's a teacher, by the way. So he teaches wow. during the day. He's just a teacher uh, during the day. That's how he earns his primary income. But then now his houses make way more than he does at his teaching job. But he enjoys doing both. You have to enjoy doing it. And I would say do not get into debt to, to do it. So he didn't just go out and buy 20 houses and pick, <laughs> or, or pick up 20 balls and start to juggle them? No, his very first house was <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, he's referencing uh, uh, po- last week's podcast. Uh, so, uh, yeah, he he went out and bought his first house, and it was a, it was a foreclosure. It was less than ten thousand wow. dollars, and it, but it looked like a ten thousand dollar house. <laughs> and he put he put a year worth of work into it and fixed it up, and finally started renting it renting it to someone, and and then you know eventually made enough money to get his second property and his third property, and then he bought an apartment building, and 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 it just went from there. So, yes, uh, it can be an investment if you can afford it. You wouldn't borrow money, though, to go put it in the stock market either. Natalie says, how do you feel about small business loans, borrowing money from friends and family, or raising investment money? It's all a form of debt. I agree. Although, uh, let, me, let me add something here. Uh, and this is a, I'm glad you asked this because it's an important point to touch on. I would never, ever, ever borrow money from friends or family, and I also will not loan money to friends or family. Now, I will give money to friends sure. and family if they need it. If Ryan came to me and said, Josh, man, I'm really struggling right now. I really need $1,000. Can I borrow it from you? I'd say, no, but you can have $1,000. I love you. I care about you. You can have this. But it changes the power dynamic in a relationship when you do that. You don't want to be beholden to any of your friends and family. And if for some reason you default because you just can't afford it, it's going to ruin that relationship forever. Yeah. So be really careful from that. I, I wouldn't borrow money for the business in general. Um, and I know startups are, are, can often be a bit different. But personally, I, I don't want to get into more debt. So uh, I, w- I would start your business with what you can afford. Uh, there's a good book uh, by Dave Ramsey. We've talked about him a couple times today called Entree Leadership. I would I would encourage you to read that as well. We'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, I would say, you know, 0% interest rate from a family member is much better than a, you know, a, a 5, 6, 7% interest rate from a bank. Um, so monetarily, maybe it, it would be better to borrow from a family member, but there is so much more risk than money uh, if you're borrowing large amounts of money from friends and family. Okay, real quick, now it's time for our, our added value portion of the show. This is where we each get to rec- recommend something that has added value to our lives. And so, Since we're talking about debt today, I'm going to recommend a few things. Ryan and I, a few months ago, recorded a money podcast, and you can find a lot of other thoughts about money in there. You can go back into our archives over at theminimalists.com slash podcast. Also, uh, Chris Hogan who, who wrote a book called Retire Inspired. You can check out that book, or you, he also has a new podcast that's coming out, and I really saw it, it was climbing, climbing the chart. So Chris Hogan has that. I mentioned earlier, but I'll mention it one, one other time. If you want to have a budget, which everyone should have a budget, especially if you are in debt, uh, check out the Every Dollar app. It's free, and uh, it's over at everydollar.com. Yes, and if you are someone who wants to be 100% debt-free and you have not heard of Dave Ramsey, uh, check out his podcast. He's got a book uh, called Total Total Money Makeover, which is a wonderful recipe to help people uh, become 100% debt-free. Um, uh, check out Dave Ramsey, and, and uh, definitely, if you have time, uh, get his book and, and read it, Total Money Makeover. Let's move on to right here, right now. This is where we get to talk about what's going on in the lives of the minimalists. Uh, A few things real quick. Our documentary, Minimalism, a documentary about the important things, uh, has hit Australia, or is coming to Australia, I should say, in uh, July. You can find that at minimalismfilm.com. There's also some additional dates in Canada, and we have about 100 screenings still going in the United States before the online release. The online release happens August 2nd. If you want to pre-order the film and get six hours worth of bonus content, you can do so over at theminimalists.com slash order. Uh, Also, I'm teaching a a four-week how to write better class. 
uh, let me just warn you, it's uh, it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work. So if you're willing to put in a lot of effort to improve your writing, whether that's business emails or writing a book or improving your blogging skills, I'm happy to help you out. But I put a lot of effort into this class, so I require uh, my students to do, to do the same exact thing. I can't I can't just upload the knowledge into your brain. It's going to require a lot of work on both of our parts. If you're interested in learning how to improve your writing, just visit howtowritebetter.org. And then also Ryan has uh, some mentoring that he does, uh, and he has a whole team of, of mentors. Yeah, if you are someone who is stuck and you need some guidance, you need some help, uh, go to theminimalists.com slash mentors. And I have a whole mentoring team there. I, I've, uh, of course, myself is on there. Um, a gentleman named Cruz Spence, who is who is a wonderful uh, relationship. He's wonderful with relationships, just hands down. Uh, anytime I need advice on relationships, that's who I go uh, and, and talk to. Um, there's a guy named Carl Widener on there. Um, he he has operated multi a multi-billion, with a B, a multi-billion dollar business. And uh, he has agreed to, uh, to, to help folks out with business plans and, and you know, in their entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, but he is a wonderful resource that, uh, that yeah, uh, he's totally there to, uh, the, for people to take advantage of. And he charges way, way less on my mentoring page than he does in real life. Um, uh, there's Vic uh, McGarry, who is a great health coach. He helps Josh and I uh, with our diet and exercise, especially when we're, when we're on the road. Um, there's uh, just a lot of other people on there. I want to sit here and go through every single one. But well, the, the, the cool thing about it, Ryan, is that this this the team. When Ryan and I first started talking about this, he he did mentoring for a long time. You know, the the thing he told me early on is I'm I'm not a life coach because life coaches don't have much life experience, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. But uh, he would often go to the, the his mentors to to get advice for his mentoring clients, and he said, "Well, wait a minute, the, I." I'm going to these people. Why can't I just send people to, to my mentors directly? Yeah. So this is a, really a team of the people who have mentored Ryan in many yeah. ways. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know there is no shame in in having a mentor. Uh, there is no way in in the world I would uh, feel as confident as I do now and have the knowledge that that I have now if it wasn't for going to others for some guidance. So yeah, check out slash mentors If you are stuck, I guarantee there's someone there that can help you get unstuck. Finally, here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Hi, my name is Claire. I'm calling from Augusta, Georgia. So I listened to episode nine of the podcast the other day, and it was the one on what next. And several people called in, and you responded to a couple questions when people were asking about essentially how to, how to figure out what their passion was and whether or not to pursue it or invest in it. And one recommendation I wanted to give was taking the Clifton Strengths Finder test. Um, I took it a couple of months ago and found a lot of value in it. It um, helped to kind of articulate for me things that were um, kind of hidden passions of mine and things that were uh, I was kind of already doing maybe, but things that sort of um, came naturally to me. And not only did I get back on what my top five strengths were, the report that the, the test generates also gives you some ideas on the types of jobs or the types of activities that someone with those strengths would enjoy. Hi, Joshua. Hi, Ryan. This is Jamie Britton Blank in Indianapolis, Indiana. And I'm calling in because somebody mentioned something recently on the podcast about wanting to simplify their social engagement, um, not feeling like they're getting much out of it, but not sure what to do because they wanted to spend time with friends. And I had a suggestion, something I've been doing recently is that I like to hike and I like to spend time with friends. So once a month I have posted what state park I'm going to be at and and basically invited anyone in my Facebook contact list to join me there. And I would think you could carry that over to just about any event. So maybe you could determine the things that are most meaningful to you and then invite your friends and family to participate. Hi, my name's Jess from Minneapolis. Um, I'm a full-time college student, part-time worker, and my favorite way to unwind is to go on rock climbing trips. Um, my travel tip for minimalizing travel expenses is so simple that it feels kind of silly to talk about, but putting away small amounts, say 20 or 30 bucks a paycheck, allows me to take these trips on a part-time budget without going into any debt. I use an awesome website called smartypig.com. It's really effective because then you don't see it and feel tempted to spend it. 
But really, any type of savings account or even just putting cash aside somewhere safe makes travel totally affordable on almost any budget. All right, y'all, that's it for this episode. If you have a question for The Minimalists, give us a call, 406-219-7839. And if you leave here with just one message, we hope you leave here with two messages. There's no such thing as good debt, but also (laughs) love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it Every little thing that you gotta have Every little thing that you gotta have You gotta reach for And you gotta grab Oh, I bet that you be fine without it So tear your eyes away Or tear